Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here once again. This is the China History Podcast, Taiwan History Part 8 today. How's that for a no-nonsense opening? For the next however many episodes it takes, we'll be focusing on Taiwan's history from the past 78 years. Last episode, we left off in 1945, following the signing of the surrender document signed between Chen Yi, representing the Republic of China, and Ando Rikichi of the now greatly diminished Empire of Japan. So let's pick up today with the rest of 1945, all of 1946, and see how things go with the ROC takeover of Taiwan. As we saw, per the agreement hammered out at the Cairo Conference, November 22nd to 26th, 1943, sovereignty over Taiwan was handed over to the Republic of China. And if the residents of Taiwan had a problem with the legality of this handover under international law, too bad. As early as 1942, Chiang Kai-shek had declared that, quote, Formosa, the Pescadores, the four northeastern provinces... Inner and Outer Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet were each a fortress essential for the nation's defense and security, end quote. He was echoing Shirlang, who, regarding Taiwan at least, had said the same thing to the Kangxi Emperor back in the 1680s. Jiang had further said, quote, Taiwan and the Pescadores were opened by Han Chinese, occupied by the Dutch, and recovered by Zheng Changgong, the loss of Taiwan to the Japanese was part of China's humiliation, and not until all lost territories have been recovered can we relax our efforts to wipe out this humiliation and save ourselves from destruction. For the Allies, most importantly the USA, Taiwan wasn't such a big deal, because nobody knew in 1942 how 1949 was going to turn out. Taiwan hadn't become a priority yet, but that didn't mean there wasn't any discussion going around at the highest levels of power. In the end, the position President Roosevelt took at the Cairo and Potsdam conferences was the final decision as far as what ended up being Taiwan's post-war fate. As we saw in early episodes, during the Qing Dynasty, mainland attitudes about Taiwan were of an untamed, wild place with headhunters and lacking in any of the creature comforts of Chinese polite society. It was considered a step down for any aspiring official sent there. And as for the southern Fujianese and Hakas who resided on Taiwan, although they were fellow Han Chinese, these particular southerners were eh, looked at as rather rough around the edges, so to speak. Well, now the shoe was on the other foot. After half a century of Japanese colonial rule and the Kominka movement, the mainlanders weren't sure what to make of these Taiwanese in the 1940s. The cauldron of anti-Japanese feelings in China was going at a full raging boil in the 1940s. Among the many problems the KMT government had with the Taiwanese was their having absorbed so much Japanese cultural influence. I mentioned last episode about these many innocent men who wore the Japanese Imperial Army uniform. Now, that was also pointed at as another reason why mainlanders might view the Taiwanese suspiciously and with a degree of contempt like they did. Not just these soldiers. Up and down Taiwan society, there were no small number of Taiwanese people who ended up getting painted with the traitor and collaborator brush. Businessmen who did well under the Japanese, no matter their politics or revulsion for their colonial masters, well, they too were suspect. Too many KMT insiders believe these five decades under Japanese rule had poisoned the minds of the Taiwanese people. And many of those who believed in this notion brought this attitude with them when they came to Taiwan later on. This rush to judgment about the loyalties and patriotism of the Taiwanese would, time and again, lead to violent clashes. One of the ironies was that, despite the humiliation of living under Japanese rule, most Taiwanese looked at the mainlanders in a similar way Hong Kongers used to look at their fellow compatriots in Shenzhen back in the early 80s. So let's start looking at the events that would ultimately lead to the Great Retreat from the Chinese mainland to Taiwan. After Retrocession Day, 
Many Taiwan elites scrambled to present their bona fides to the KMT authorities that showed them as loyal and upright Chinese citizens. They went out of their way to put on a good face and play up their Chinese nationalism and play down their association with the Japanese, especially during the war years. Chen Yi was sent to Taiwan to serve as chief executive, a new office created just to deal with the matter of all things Taiwan. And not governor general yet. Chen Yi was also made garrison commander in charge of all military and paramilitary affairs. Taiwan wasn't immediately made a province of the republic. For the time being, they were ruled by a military government. Since his appointment as the one in charge... It had been Chen Yi's responsibility to not only deal with the Japanese surrender, he was also placed in the enviable and potentially lucrative position of dealing with the spoils of war. The Japanese had to walk away from quite a lot of real estate and assets. Chen Yi made sure to take care of himself and his friends in the dispersal of many of these assets. So while the ink was still drying on the document he had signed on October 25, 1945 with Ando Rikichi, the Chen Yi administration quickly earned a reputation for corruption and for the many ways they heaped disrespect on the local Taiwanese, giving them no say in the matter. Chen Yi was actually fluent in Japanese, had a Japanese wife, and had studied in Japan. But despite all that, he refused to speak this language to Taiwan officials who, in 1945, only knew how to speak Hokkien, Hakka, or Japanese. And early on, there developed a kind of mutual animosity that kept getting worse, as we'll see. Chen Yi stuffed his administration with mainlanders, and the closer to Chuchiang province they were, the better. As past invasions and military interventions by others have proven... Well, it's one thing to blow into a country and take it over, but it's another thing entirely to manage and govern it. Very quickly, well before 1949, many Taiwanese, observing mainlander behavior there, viewed them as the new colonialists, replacing Japan in their actions and deeds. This included the smash-and-grab behavior regarding all the assets left behind by the Japanese. There were no small number of Taiwanese who, right after 1895, had their homes and businesses seized by the Japanese. Those who were hoping to move back into their old digs were powerless to do anything and were forced to grin and bear it after seeing their former homes and businesses handed over to well-placed KMT officials. And those Taiwanese who collaborated with the Japanese, same thing for them. Many were kicked out of their homes whatever they owned was fair game for seizure. And not only that, plenty of Taiwanese who did not collaborate with the Japanese got their homes and assets seized anyway. And the closer one's connections to Chen Yi were, the better anyone's chances were of getting in on the action. Crime skyrocketed with the new police force staffed almost entirely by mainlanders, more interested in getting backhanders from Taiwanese citizens than enforcing the law. Cholera and bubonic plague, two scourges of humankind that had been eradicated in Taiwan during the Japanese colonial period, returned in force. And the way the government handled the epidemic turned out to be a harbinger of things to come under early KMT rule. I mentioned in part four about the Chinese word Ren, the people of this province, meaning Taiwan, and Ren were people who came from the mainland. And that thick black line that polarized the two peoples was starting to be drawn right here. The acrimony moving forward would just keep getting worse, one outrage and incident at a time. The local Taiwanese realized only too soon these KMT nationalist military and political figures were just as odious as the Japanese, except without the Japanese competency. Overwhelmingly, mainlanders controlled the government on Taiwan. There were token Taiwanese who held some positions, for sure, but the tone was already being set by the KMT. I mentioned last time, right after retrocession day in October 1945, nationalist troops started arriving at big numbers. There was a massive gathering of local Taiwanese waving flags and 
offering a warm and enthusiastic welcome to the first 48,000 ROC troops who enter Taipei, no longer called Taihoku. And these post-Japanese surrender Han Chinese soldiers arriving in boatloads on Taiwan for the first time. These weren't Fujian people. Like most rank-and-file foot soldiers who fought for the nationalists, the men were not city folk. And there's lots of stories of these soldiers from the countryside staring wide-eyed at the marvels of Taiwan cities, comparing this modernity to what they had known in China. It didn't take long for these boots on the ground to get wise and commence shaking down the local residents for financial gain. Officials, too. They saw the Taiwanese locals as fair game. And some felt well, this treatment that they meted out was payback for their support of Japan. And furthermore, there was widespread belief among the KMT officials and soldiers that well, some sort of gratitude and humility needed to be paid to the KMT troops for their suffering, bearing the brunt of Japan's aggression. Chinese people had been getting mauled nonstop from July 1937 to August 1945, and people on Taiwan had it easy. I know more than half of you aren't residing here in the U.S., so let me explain. We have this term, carpetbagger. It came out of the post-U.S. Civil War era. These were northerners who came down to the south in droves and became these ugly, opportunistic, and exploitive group, mercilessly taking advantage of shell-shocked southerners. And the key thing about these carpetbaggers was that they were outsiders. Well, the KMT, as early as end 1945, right away acquired this odious reputation as carpetbaggers. A lot of assets, including entire plants and equipment, were packed up and shipped back to the mainland. All traces of Japanese political, cultural, or economic presence started getting scrubbed away. And no matter the antipathy or admiration of each Taiwan resident to their now former colonial masters, they were all viewed as collaborators. And once again, let me uh, reiterate, there remained this burning resentment felt by mainlanders that, even though many parts of Taiwan had been bombed to bits by the Americans, in no way were the Taiwanese forced to suffer the terrible horrors, hardships, and violence seen on the mainland. Chun Yi put government monopolies in place to manage the distribution of many commodities. Now, this was nothing new. The Japanese established a monopoly on opium in 1896. And government monopolies were later rolled out by the Japanese on wine and spirits, tobacco, salt, camphor, and a few other commodities. So cigarettes also fell under the government monopoly. If you wanted to sell them on the street corner or in a park, you needed a special license. More about that when we get to the February 28th incident. Any hopes of allowing private participation in these newly established state monopolies were dashed early on. Having exclusive control over these commodities, all of them necessities of life except booze and ciggies, and some might argue that point with me, these monopolies involved fabulous profits to government coffers. It was more profitable than printing money. So at this point in 1945, Taiwan's population stood roughly at about 6.6 .6 million. So keep that in mind. It won't stay that way for long. As I mentioned last episode, thanks to American bombing raids in 1944-45, the Taiwan economy was back on its heels. The island had gone from being one of the most prosperous places in East Asia to relative poverty in just a short time. All the economic maladies of the mainland are just as familiar on Taiwan, including rampant inflation, a worthless currency, and a flood of bankruptcies. The residents living in Taiwan were now facing hardships that no one could have imagined. Two-thirds of the people went to bed each night cold, hungry, or both. Once a rice-producing juggernaut with agriculture now deeply degraded, whatever rice and other foodstuffs produced that were so desperately needed in Taiwan, was shipped across the strait to aid in the Civil War. January 1946, 
came the announcement that Taiwanese young men would have to register for the draft to go fight the communists. And the pushback amongst the people of Taiwan was sufficient enough for Chun Yi to back down. April 1946, Chun Yi allowed for elections that, surprisingly, plenty of Taiwanese participated and, and were elected to serve. And they had to swear a loyalty oath to the KMT and have a squeaky clean background with no unsightly taints, but they were allowed to run. In May 1946, this new Taiwan Provincial Assembly met for the first time. Well, in no time at all, this legislative body turned into a 1978-79 democracy wall kind of a mechanism where Taiwanese members of this provincial assembly openly pointed accusing fingers at the more corrupt KMT officials who routinely and unashamedly abused their power and authority. The press, too, was allowed to freely print stories that many times were highly critical of the government and the corruption they fostered. All this freedom to condemn KMT government corruption or incompetence was allowed for a while, but come end February 1947, the whip's going to come down hard. We'll get to that in a bit. After moving back to the pre-wartime capital of Nanjing, Chiang Kai-shek and the First Lady, Song Mei-ling, they paid a visit to Taiwan. This was on October 25th, 1946. Other than a brief uneventful stopover in October 1921 as a young 34-year-old revolutionary, this was the Generalissimo's first visit to Taiwan. In the year since retrocession day, Taiwan had already started to come back. Inflation was still completely out of control and causing widespread suffering. The new Taiwan currency was also having a tough time. Yet in Jiang's eyes, it wasn't as bad as it was on the mainland. Industry had come roaring back, and Jiang was pleased to see how well the provincial government had done taking over all these Japanese assets, as well as all the lovers of government and government administration. And though he had recently lost his loyal secret police chief, Dai Li, Jiang had trusted men in charge of security on Taiwan, familiar with all the trade secrets Dai Li had taught. Whether or not Jiang had already started thinking about Taiwan as a possible safe haven should worst come to worst on the mainland, well, we can't know for sure. He certainly liked what he was seeing, and because it was this island fortress, well, all indications were that the place had yet to become riddled with CCP cadres and spies. Over on the mainland around this time... General George C. Marshall was still trying to negotiate a ceasefire between the KMT and CCP. 1946 started off looking promising as far as averting a civil war went. At least the Americans thought so. How naive everyone was in retrospect. At this stage, Chiang Kai-shek was wheeling and dealing with the Soviets and the Americans, desperately trying to gain an advantage. In May of 1946, Jiang straight out asked General Marshall if he could spare a couple armies to come help them in this developing situation with the communists. But Marshall flat out denied Jiang, saying that was tantamount to the U.S. getting mixed up in a civil war. It didn't hurt to ask. In June, with the newly branded People's Liberation Army on their back foot, Jiang was determined to defy the Americans and their demands for a ceasefire and finish Mao off taking Manchuria back in the process. But just when Jiang thought he could plunge that dagger into the communists, Marshall stayed his hand. As you might remember, on January 7, 1947, Marshall threw in the towel and returned to the States in disgust. Jiang's popularity in the U.S. executive branch by this time was at an all-time low. Unlike his predecessor in the Oval Office, Harry Truman, who called Jiang cash my check, but he wasn't a fan of the Generalissimo. He publicly stated that the two Chinese sides, the KMT and CCP, would have to sort out their differences amongst themselves. But despite this sentiment, as far as the U.S. government was concerned, the Republic of China, Zhonghua Minguo, was still the legal government of China, and it stayed that way for another 33 years. (laughs) 
The three great PLA campaigns that will finish the Nationalists off wouldn't start happening till November 1948. As 1947 dawned, despite the danger signs, there remained hope that the KMT would still enjoy a favorable result in their competition with the Communists. And by January 1947, as the people on Taiwan welcomed the year of the pig, so much popular discontent had been percolating beneath the surface for far too long. You know, back in the summer of 1980, when I made my first trip to Taiwan, there were many topics that were very taboo. But one topic in particular was more taboo than any other. If you mentioned it, you had to look around first and make sure no one was within earshot. Not until 1995, in my children's own lifetime, after President Li Donghui publicly mentioned this incident, was it even safe to talk about it? I'm talking about the 228 incident, the RR Ba Shiqian. The U.S. vice consul based in Taipei was a man named George Kerr. He wrote a pretty famous book that's easily obtainable today from Camphor Books called Formosa Betrayed. Kerr was an eyewitness to the events surrounding 228. Such were the times he lived in. He couldn't get his book published. Such an explosive topic. Such trying times during McCarthyism and the Red Scare. People in the halls of power in the United States were reeling from losing China, and they were scrambling to apportion blame for this foreign policy setback. You had to be out of your mind to swim against that tide. This book that mainly focuses on 228 couldn't even get published till 1965. With this book and the decidedly anti-KMT position he took, George Kerr had to have known about the buzzsaw he was walking straight into. 228 was a subject that no one wanted to talk about in the public prints. To do so was to take a swipe at the KMT government, which in the eyes of the U.S.-China lobby and their oversized megaphone, it was tantamount to declaring yourself to be a communist sympathizer during the decades of the 1950s and 60s in America. Yeah, there was no more hideous taint one could have than that. And one other thing, a few CHP listeners even expressed concern to me about how to present such a sensitive issue and please take care when discussing 228. Someone even suggested to me to just leave things be at 1945 and don't go any further in this Taiwan series than that. Well, some of you who perhaps are not familiar with this incident might have your interest peaked by now. Well, remember at the outset I mentioned that all the most lucrative industries were taken over by the Taiwan provincial government and monopolies were established to run them. And like I said, one of the categories of goods subject to the government monopoly was tobacco. Even here in the beautiful country, we're all familiar with these people who we affectionately know as unlicensed hawkers, purveying many necessities of life at reasonable prices. Well, there was one such woman, surnamed Lin. Lin Jiang Mai was her name. She didn't obtain a license from the Monopoly Bureau and was out selling ciggies in a Taipei park on the morning of February 27th, 1947. She didn't have a license, and a couple officers from the Monopoly Bureau accosted her, confiscated her cigs and all her money. And for good measure, when she protested, one of the officers took out his pistol and with the butt, he smacked her right on the head. She fell at his feet and died right there on the spot. There was no question about the illegality of Madame Lin Chiang Mai's actions, but any way you look at it, that kind of justice was you know, pretty extreme. This whole thing, as you might imagine, attracted quite a scene and a crowd assembled in no time. And these two officers, facing down that angry mob, eh, perhaps got to taste the same element of fear as these Shanghai policemen on May 30th, 1925, who found themselves in a similar kind of situation. And just like those policemen in the Shanghai International Settlement, these Monopoly Bureau officers, perhaps feeling terrorized, fired into the crowd, and one of the people there was shot and killed. 
The two officers bolted from the scene, leaving their vehicle behind and fled for their lives. The crowd was pretty worked up from what they had just witnessed, and you have to look at everything that followed in the wake of this incident within the context of the year-long discontent felt by the people of Taiwan at how Chen Yi had been governing on the island up to now. Well, that was February 27th, but this incident, it's not known as 227. It's known as 228. And on the following day, February 28th, about 2,000 or so protesters marched to the offices of the Monopoly Bureau. And like any protest, there was chanting, signs, and Everyone was demanding justice for what had happened the day before. The Monopoly Bureau eh, perhaps knew what was coming, so they had everything locked down tight. The protesters couldn't enter the gates, and no one would come out to speak with them. So they started walking in the direction of the Governor General's office, arriving eh, right around lunchtime. The security staff guarding the entry to the compound, staring out at this Angry crowd of protesters fired their guns, killing two and wounding several others. Meanwhile, far away in another part of town, there was another incident of Monopoly Bureau officials mistreating some locals, a couple of kids actually, selling the same old smuggled smokes. So these two officers pummeled them and kicked them around a little, you know, making it a little hard for them, you know. And a mob quickly gathered and descended on these two agents and meted out some punishment, killing them in the process. And then, in the passion of the moment, a government office close by was ransacked. Word got out on the Twitter of the day, i.e. the radio, that there was a big demonstration taking place in the city. And this drew massive crowds out into the streets, ready to vent their spleen over all the... You know what, they had to eat since retrocession day 15 months earlier. There was a lot of angry chanting and loud talking. Many were even exclaiming that they were better off under the Japanese than the KMT. Nobody was holding back. This was all quite a shock to the government on Taiwan. Chun Yi was caught off guard, and because of the civil war on the mainland, he didn't have enough muscle on the ground in Taiwan to take on an island full of angry residents, demonstrating their outrage quite vociferously, mainly against him. So he adopted the wisest strategy he could think of, which called for a great amount of sweet-talking and promises to assuage the demonstrators. Then at the same time, he called his boss, Jiang Kai-shek, and told him eh, he had a situation on his hands. Jiang made a few calls, and on March 9th, he sent the 21st Division of the Nationalist Army in the direction of the port of Qilong. And when the troops arrived, they disembarked from their boats with their guns blazing. Roughly 18,000 to 28,000 people would be shot down when it was all over. Even by today's standards, in a world gone crazy, that's not a small number. So great was the carnage and the atrocities being committed, Jiang had to call Chen Yi and tell him to cool it and to make sure that no one took on any vengeance against the protesters. That order came a little late. There were plenty of eyewitnesses that day who wrote about the events that followed. Rather than listen to my narrative, I thought I'd close things out today by reading a few excerpts from U.S. Ambassador John Layton Stewart and the husband and wife journalists Tillman and Peggy Durden. Till Durden was a very respected reporter for the New York Times, and Peggy wrote for The Nation. And like with Ambassador Stewart, eh, they saw the whole thing. Let me first quote Ambassador Stewart's memo he wrote to Chiang Kai-shek on April 18, 1947, 49 days after February 28th. This was uh, quite a lengthy 8,700-word memo he wrote to the Generalissimo. I'm only going to read a few excerpts. And I'll begin with John Layton Stewart's words regarding what happened when the demonstrators marched on the Governor General's office on 228. Quote, At about 2 o'clock, it reached a wide intersection adjacent to the government grounds. Without warning, a machine gun mounted somewhere on the government building opened fire, swept and dispersed the crowd, and killed at least four. Two consular officers drove through the square immediately after the shots were fired. 
Two of the dead were picked up a few minutes later by an UNRWA officer. UNRWA was the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration. They had mopping up duty following World War II. Anyway, Stewart continues, This shooting was the signal for a citywide outburst of anger against all mainland Chinese, regardless of rank or occupation. Many were beaten, cars were burned, and in some few cases, offices and houses of minor officials were sacked and the contents burned in the street. It was observed that the Formosans refrained from looting. One Formosan was found attempting to take cigarettes from a burning heap. He was forced to kneel and beg forgiveness from the crowd and was then driven away. Another was severely beaten. Tires and other equipment were observed to have been left untouched on overturned cars and remained in evidence until the Formosans lost control of the city March 9th. Martial law was invoked in the late afternoon, February 28th. Armed military patrols began to appear in the city, firing at random wherever they went. At 10 o'clock a.m., March 1st, the chairman of the Taipei Municipal People's Political Council invited the council, representatives of the National and Provincial PPC Councils, and the Taiwan representatives to the National Assembly to form a committee for settling the so-called Monopoly Bureau incident. It was decided to send a delegation to call on the Governor General, requesting, among other things, that a committee be formed to settle the problems jointly by the people and the government. These men recognized that, with the firing on the crowd at the government building, the issues had become much greater than mere punishment of Monopoly Bureau agents and a financial settlement for the injured and dead. They urged the governor to lift martial law so that the dangers of a clash between the unarmed civil population and the military would be averted. This the government agreed to do at midnight, March 1st, meanwhile forbidding meetings and parades. On that day... Buses and trucks, filled with squads of government troops armed with machine guns and rifles, began to sweep through the streets, firing indiscriminately. Machine guns were set up at important intersections, and shooting grew in volume during the afternoon. At no time were Formosans observed to have arms, and no instances of Formosan use of arms were reported in Taipei. Nevertheless, the military were evidently allowed free use in what appeared to be an attempt to frighten the people into obedience. At approximately 5 o'clock, the Governor General broadcast a message which appeared to have increased the anger of the people. He stated that the Monopoly Bureau incident had been settled by a generous payment of money, and without referring to the machine gun fire from his own office, he accused the Formosans of increased rioting, but generally promised to lift martial law at midnight. While he was broadcasting, members of the American consulate staff witnessed a severe clash between armed government forces and unarmed crowds. Mounted troops had killed two pedestrians near the compound. A crowd gathered, and a few hundred yards away, Railway Administration Special Armed Police suddenly opened fire from within the administration building and killed two more pedestrians. The crowd turned on mainland railway bureau employees found nearby. Two more pedestrians who looked like coolies were shot about 300 feet from the consulate gates. Then, as the bodies were carried off, the crowd was observed to assemble again some distance from a mounted patrol near an intersection. Suddenly, with no warning, a long burst of machine gun fire swept the area. Some of the wounded and dead were carried past the consulate gates. It is stated reliably that at least 123 were felled by this burst and that 25 died. How many of the injured walked away is not known. End quote. Ambassador Stewart's memo detailed all the desperate measures Chun Yi took to appease the protesters, promising no effort would be spared to get to the bottom of this and to compensate all concerned. Let me pick up where John Layton Stewart described the moment nationalist troops showed up. Quote, Foreign observers who were at Geelong, March 8th, state that in mid-afternoon the streets of the city were cleared suddenly by machine gun fire directed at no particular objects or persons. After dark, ships docked and discharged the troops for which the governor apparently had been waiting. Fairly reliable sources estimate that about 
2,000 police were landed, followed by about 8,000 troops with light equipment, including U.S. Army jeeps. Men and equipment were rushed to Taipei. It's reported that about 3,000 men were landed at Kaohsiung simultaneously. Troops were reported continuing to arrive on March 17th. Beginning March 9th, there was widespread and indiscriminate killing. Soldiers were seen bayoneting coolies without apparent provocation in front of a consulate staff residence. Soldiers were seen to rob passers-by. An old man protesting the removal of a woman from his house was seen cut down by two soldiers. The Canadian nurse in charge of an adjacent mission hospital was observed bravely to make seven trips under fire into the crowded area across the avenue to treat persons shot down or bayoneted. And once, as she supervised the movement of a wounded man into the hospital, the bearers with her were fired upon. Some of the patients brought in had been shot and hacked to pieces. Young Formosan men were observed tied together, being prodded at bayonet point towards the city limits. A Formosan woman, primary school teacher, attempting to reach her home, was shot in the back and robbed near the mission compound. A British businessman attempting to rescue an American woman whose house was being riddled with machine gun fire from a nearby emplacement was fired upon and narrowly escaped, one bullet cutting through his clothing and another being deflected from the steering gear of his jeep. Another foreigner saw a youth forced to dismount from his bicycle before a military policeman, who thereupon lacerated the man's hand so badly with his bayonet that the man could not pick up his bicycle. Anyone thought to be trying to hide or run was shot down. Looting began wherever the soldiers saw something desirable. On March 11th, it was reported that a systematic search for middle school students had begun during the night. School enrollment lists were used. A broadcast earlier had ordered all youths who had been members of the Security Patrol or the Youth League to turn in their weapons. Concurrently, all middle school students were ordered to remain at home. If a student was caught on the street while trying to obey the first order, he was killed. If the searchers found a weapon in his house, he met a like fate. If a student was not at home, his brother or his father was seized as hostage. A reliable estimate was made that about 700 students had been seized in Taipei by March 13th. 200 are said to have been seized in Jilong. 50 are reported to have been killed in Matsuyama and 30 at Kokuto in the suburbs of Taipei on the night of March 9th. After three days in Taipei streets, government forces began to push out into the suburban and rural areas. Mounted machine gun patrols were observed along the high roads 15 to 20 miles from Taipei, shooting at random in village streets in what appeared to be an effort to break any spirit of resistance. Manhunts were observed being conducted through the hills near the Unra Hostel. Foreigners saw bodies in the streets of Danshui, end quote. Let me now quote from the article filed by Till Durden for the New York Times on March 28, 1947. Quote, Nanking, March 28th. Foreigners who have just returned to China from Formosa corroborate reports of wholesale slaughter by Chinese troops and police during anti-government demonstrations a month ago. These witnesses estimate that 10,000 Formosans were killed by the Chinese forces. The killings were described as completely unjustified in view of the nature of the demonstrations. The anti-government demonstrations were said to have been by unarmed persons whose intentions were peaceful. Every foreign report to Nanking denies charges that communists or Japanese inspired or organized the parades. Foreigners who left Formosa a few days ago say that an uneasy peace had been established almost everywhere, but executions and arrests continued. Many Formosans were said to have fled to the hills, fearing they would be killed if they returned to their homes. An American who had just arrived in China from Taihoku said that troops from the mainland arrived there March 7th and indulged in three days of indiscriminate killing and looting. For a time, everyone seen on the streets was shot at. Homes were broken into and occupants killed. In the poorer sections, the streets were said to have been littered with dead. 
There were instances of beheadings and mutilation of bodies, and women were raped, the Americans said. Two foreign women who were near at Pingdong, near Kaohsiung, called the actions of the Chinese soldiers there a massacre. They said unarmed Formosans took over the administration of the town peacefully on March 4th and used the local radio station to caution against violence. Chinese were well-received and invited to lunch with the Formosan leaders. Later, a bigger group of soldiers came and launched a sweep through the streets. The people were machine-gunned. Groups were rounded up and executed. The man who had served as the town spokesman was killed. His body was left for a day in a park, and no one was permitted to remove it. A Briton described similar events at Kaohsiung, where unarmed Formosans had taken over the running of the city. And he said that after several days, Chinese soldiers from an outlying fort deployed through the streets, killing hundreds with machine guns and rifles and raping and looting. Formosan leaders were thrown into prison, many bound with thin wire that cut deep into the flesh. The foreign witnesses reported that leaflets signed with the name of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek promised leniency and urging all who had fled to return and were dropped from airplanes. As a result, many came back to be imprisoned or executed. There seemed to be a policy of killing off all the best people, one foreigner asserted. The foreigners' stories are fully supported by reports of every important foreign embassy or legation in Nanking. Formosans are reported to be asking United Nations action on their case. Some have approached foreign consuls to ask that Formosa be put under the jurisdiction of Allied Supreme Command or be made an American protectorate. Formosan hostility to the mainland Chinese has deepened. Two women who described events at Pingdong said that when Formosans assembled to take over the administration of the town, they sang the Star-Spangled Banner. End quote. Again, that was uh, Tillman Durden's account of events. His wife Peggy filed this for the nation on May 24th, 1947. I'm just going to read a few paragraphs beginning with the response to the initial protest on 228. I think you can get the gist of what she is saying. Quote, China put down the revolt with brutal repression, terror, and massacre. Mainland soldiers and police fired first, killing thousands indiscriminately, then more selectively, hunted down and jailed or slaughtered students, intellectuals, prominent businessmen, and civic leaders. Foreigners estimate that at least 5,000 Taiwanese were killed and executions are still going on. Governor General Chen Yi has turned a movement against bad government into one against any Chinese government. Nanking has again demonstrated that its chief solution for political and economic crisis is force. In spite of a curtain of censorship and official misrepresentation, the tragic events that took place in Formosa in March are well known here. The rioting which followed was not consciously revolutionary, but was against the hated monopoly police which symbolized for the people the government's exploitation of their island. Barricaded in its offices, the government lost control of the city. Shops closed, transportation broke down, mobs of Taiwanese, still unarmed, beat up a number of mainland Chinese and burned their possessions, though not their homes. Truckloads of police rushed through Taipei streets, machine-gunning the demonstrators while Governor Chen Yi was busily broadcasting conciliatory promises. During this period... Not a single foreigner saw an armed Taiwanese. With calculated trickery, Chen Yi continued his efforts to appease the people while he waited for military reinforcements. On March 2nd, over the radio, he expressed his love for the Taiwanese and promised that no one would be prosecuted for rioting, that the families of the dead would be compensated, and that he would appoint a committee to settle the incident. This group, composed of mainlanders and representative Taiwanese, most of whom have since been shot, was to be known as the Committee to Settle the February 28th Incident, and was to present to him by March 10th their suggestions for the reform of the administration. Meanwhile, the spark ignited in Taipei had spread down the whole length of Taiwan. In the first few days of March, 
The Taiwanese took over the administration of almost every city. As far as can be discovered, they seized control in most instances without the use of firearms. Violence was usually limited to beatings, though some officials were killed. On March 7th, Chun Yi's committee handed in its recommendations. Reasonably enough, they included the following. That Taiwan be given provincial, not colonial, status. That provincial magistrates and city mayors be elected before June. That a larger proportion of Taiwanese be given administrative, police, and judicial posts. That all special police be abolished and no political arrests be permitted. That freedom of press and speech and the right to strike be granted. That managers of all public enterprises be Taiwanese. That committees be elected to supervise these public enterprises and the factories taken over from the Japanese. That the trade and monopoly bureaus be abolished. That the political and economic rights of aboriginals be guaranteed and that Taiwanese be appointed to as many Army, Navy, and Air Force posts in Taiwan as possible, that detained war criminals be released, that the central government repay Taiwan for the expropriated sugar and rice, that garrison headquarters be abolished, and to avoid misuse of military might. These proposals were not presented as an ultimatum. They were clearly a basis for negotiation. At this point... Although most of the island was still in the hands of the people, Chun Yi could have reached an agreement with them which would have ensured the Nanking government's continued control of Taiwan and the cooperation of the Taiwanese. He only needed to move honestly towards reform, but he had at no time any intention of establishing peace by compromise. This was a revolt, and he would crush it. He was obliged to temporize and deceive until his troops arrived. On the afternoon and evening of March 8th, without warning or provocation, the streets of Qilong and Taipei were cleared with gunfire to cover the entry of mainland troops. These reinforcements consisted mainly of the 21st Division, a Sichuan outfit with a reputation for brutality. In the next four or five days, more than a thousand unarmed Taiwanese in the Taipei-Qilong area alone were massacred. A year and a half earlier, many of them had joyously welcomed the arrival of the Chinese troops. Now, truckloads of soldiers armed with machine guns and automatic rifles shot their way through the streets. Soldiers demanded entry into homes, killed the first person who appeared, and looted the premises. Bodies floated thick in Jilong Harbor and in the river, which flows by Taipei. Twenty young men were castrated, their ears cut off, and their noses slashed. A foreigner watched police cut off a boy's hands before bayonetting him because he had not dismounted from his bicycle quickly enough. The radio advised students who had fled from the city to return to their homes. But when they did so, they were killed. Any prominent person was in grave danger. By March 14th, the killing had tapered off in Taipei. In other cities, the terror followed the same pattern. End quote. Well, we're running long here, but this was, by any historical standard, a watershed event in the history of Taiwan. But it doesn't end there. Remember the Shanghai Massacre two decades before on April 12, 1927? Well, there was the initial massacre of the communists and leftists that happened over a four-day period that was followed by the White Terror. Well, it was the same thing in Taiwan. There was all the killing and violence that happened over a two-week period beginning on February 28th. Then there was this other White Terror, and it lasted a long time. And that's what we're going to look at next time in Part 9. Like any emotive issue, eh, there's more than one way of looking at it. Even with the most obvious crimes or injustices, two people can have two completely divergent opinions. The three accounts of 228 that I presented to you obviously shared the same point of view, one that was decidedly anti-KMT, anti-Jiang Kai-shek. And if you lived in Taiwan between 1947 and the 1990s, you knew to keep your opinions about these events bottled up. All right, let's shut things down for now. We're going to pick up next time with the aftermath of 228. Over on the mainland, the nationalists are going to go down in ignominious defeat, which will 
profoundly affect the future of Taiwan, including the justice and reconciliation for what had gone down in Taiwan in February and March 1947. My thanks to everyone who stayed to the end. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from L.A., and you know what I'm going to do. I'm cordially inviting you to come back again once more for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.